I think uh, let's let's go ahead and get started. People should continue to trickle in. So hi everybody, um, I'm Zach Firestone with Shadow Ventures. Just real quick about us for anybody who doesn't know, we are an early stage venture capital firm that focuses on real estate and construction tech startups. We invest at the seed stage. We also have an incubator program with startups around the world. It's all virtual and we help them to grow their business. Today we are very fortunate to have Dave Meltzer with us. He knows a thing or two about building businesses. Do a very, very quick overview of him. You're here to hear him, not me, so I'll turn it over after just one minute. Dave is the CEO currently of Sports One Marketing. Formerly, he was the CEO of Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment Agency, which inspired Gary Maguire, the movie I'm sure you've all seen. He's a three-time best-selling author. He's the producer and host of Elevator Pitch and The Playbook. Um, he's got an incredible story, a roller coaster of success. I won't spoil it. He'll tell it to you. Real quick, last thing, I want to tell everybody how I got to know Dave, because I think it's very relevant. <clears throat> Excuse me, a few years ago, I was working in a business development role at a startup in New York, connected with Dave, didn't really amount to anything as far as that scenario with the company. Dave left it off by saying, reach out to me in the future if you ever need anything. Okay, a lot of people say that, especially a lot of venture capitalists say that. Um, but a year or two later, I was looking for a new opportunity and I remembered Dave and I reached out. Dave emailed me back right away and said, listen, you're in New York. I'm traveling in from San Diego. I will be on Long Island later this week for the Forbes Secret Knock conference. If anybody doesn't know Secret Knock, there are these very elite conferences. You have to be invited. Dave was, you know, headlining that event. He said, find this person, this woman at the conference. He'll set you up when you get there. I took the train out to Long Island. I went to this event at the hotel. I'm the person. She escorted me right over to Dave. There were hundreds of people waiting to see him. She escorted me to him. He, inv he warmly, you know, greeted me and said, after the show, let's talk. After he finished his speech, he said, you know what? I want to help you more. Loaded into a Mini Cooper, I don't know where that came from, I don't even remember, with a bunch of his people, and I think he sat on somebody's lap so that I could join. He bought me a train ticket, and we rode back from Long Island to Manhattan. He had no idea who the hell I was, and on the train, he said, pull out your computer, tell me what you want to do, now type out this list of names, email it to me, and I will make those introductions for you. And that's what he did, and in fact, my next job, the next startup that I worked at, was a result of the introduction that Dave made. So ever since Dave's been a mentor, thank you, Dave, I turn it over to you. Everybody's excited to hear your life story. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, hopefully the life story we'll share with you is the lessons that I've learned because uh, now more than ever, people are realizing uh, as we're questioning the one thing that we've taken for granted, our existence, that life is merely about lessons. Um, the lessons keep on coming until we learn them. Uh, if you have pain or rain in your life, it's because you haven't learned a lesson yet. Mental, physical, spiritual, emotional pain is just an indication that you have a lesson to learn. And that's why I've lived my life in the enjoyment of the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of my own potential. And that has grown throughout the years, accelerated, utilized the valuable bunch of lessons that hopefully I'll share with you and can be utilized today in this compressed time of uncertainty, this time of accelerated change, uh, allowing you to effectuate what you want in your life and to pursue the potential that you have. Um, I grew up in a world of not enough. I uh, grew up with a single mom and six kids, five boys and a girl. My mom used to pack my dinner in a station wagon in between the two jobs that she worked one being a second grade teacher, the other filling turnstiles of greeting cards in convenience stores like 7-Eleven. Uh, the interesting thing about the world of not enough is I still was very happy. I was blessed to be born with a quantum happiness gene. Uh, not everybody I have learned is in the same birth uh, right, uh, but yet everyone can pursue their potential of being happy. Uh, but the one time that I wasn't happy as a child was when I realized that my mom uh, was super stressed about finances. I'd catch her crying when a car broke down or couldn't afford food or a dishwasher would break, something would happen and I'd catch her crying. And in my mind, as little as five years old, I'd say to myself, someday I'm gonna buy my mom a house and a car. Someday I'm going to achieve ultimate happiness and do that for her. And money will buy me happiness and it will buy me love. And so that was my journey. Uh, I believe money is a, an energy. It's an object of energy. It's a currency, an object of energy that we put into the flow to get what we want. Uh, if you have a green card, you can get so much. If you have a gold card, you get more. If you have a platinum card, even more. But if you have a black card, you can get whatever you want. 
And so I was in the pursuit of the black card consistently and persistently and enjoying that. Uh, at a very young age, I realized that um, you, you know, everybody talks about wanting to do what they loved. Uh, I was always not a why person. I was a what person. What do I need to do in order to get my mom a house? Because for me, I thought everyone had the same why, which was to help somebody they loved, right? It, it, to do something for someone they loved. That, that was ultimately always our why. And people that always said, oh, I want to find what I love to do and this and this, it seemed like BS to me because I thought they were just wimping out of the fact that they didn't know their what. And so I was blessed because I knew my what. I wanted to buy my mom a house and a car that would buy me happiness and love. It was that simple. Unfortunately, my first what uh, was related to a how that wasn't aligned with my conscious, subconscious, and unconscious being. Meaning my potential probably wouldn't allow me to buy my mom a house and a car because what I wanted to do to buy my mom a house and a car was to be a professional athlete, most notably a, a football uh, player. Now, I work really hard. I enjoyed the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential. I learned to enjoy the things about it that I didn't enjoy off the bat, uh, which was a key skill set of mine to learn to love what I did no matter what. Uh, and I carried that through my entire life and I still carry it through now. I you know, ran the most notable sports agency in the world and were around the greatest celebrities, athletes and entertainers. And everybody, even for my own profession has told me, oh, I wish I did what you, you're so lucky, you love what you do. You know, I don't love everything I do. And you'll see through my career, I didn't love getting taped and watching film and all of those things. I love playing in football games, but that was only about 10% of what I did. So I learned to love the other 90% in the pursuit of my potential. Anyway, I ended up getting a scholarship to college, learned very quickly that my quantum potential had been close to reach because I got ran over my freshman year uh, by Christian Okoye, uh, better known as the Nigerian nightmare. Uh, next year, he was already AFC player of the year. So I remember lying on my back. Uh, some of you may have the same types of parent that I had. I was lying on my back after getting run over thinking to myself, doctor, lawyer, or failure. Um, I had this extraordinary mom. My five other siblings all went to the Ivy Leagues. They all were academics. Uh, they all bought into my mom's doctor, lawyer, failure. Fetus isn't fully developed till after graduate school. Greatest parenting advice that I get from my mom and give to others is number one, wake your kids up early. My mom woke all six of us up at 5 a.m. If you wake your kids up at 5 a.m. or earlier, they'll never be in trouble because they can't be awake long enough to get in trouble. Uh, two, she was a martial arts expert, third degree black belt in the martial art that everyone should have. She was a third degree black belt in the martial art of Jewish guilt, but Catholic guilt works, any type of guilt works. So wake your kids up early and guilt them to do what they what you want them to do. Seems to be the best parenting advice that I have with four kids of my own. Uh, anyway, after I realized I wasn't going to be a professional football player, I immediately went to doctor, doctor, lawyer, failure. Another great lesson was learned, one that changed my life, because at 18 years old, I went to visit my brother uh, who was doing his residency. And the first thing out of my mouth, I'm pre-med at a great college. I looked around and I said to him, man, I hate hospitals. He looked at me, almost fell over. He said, Dave, what are you talking about? I said, well, I hate hospitals. He goes, you know, doctors have to be in hospitals. I'm like, well, I'm going to be a sports doctor. That's training rooms and sidelines. I'm not going to be in a hospital. He then gave me one of the best pieces of advice that I give to everyone, especially now. He told me, be more interested than interesting. Be more interested than interesting. Be in the pursuit of your potential. When you're interesting, you're not in the pursuit of anything. You're a feature and benefit dumper. You're a manipulator, overseller, backend seller, and most likely even a liar. When you're more interested, you are in the pursuit of your potential. You're expanding, growing, and accelerating. You're on the path in which inspires people. You must be what you can be when you are more interested than interesting. And that lesson is held with me since I've been 18 years old. But since I hated hospitals and it wasn't aligned with my personal experiential giving and receiving values, I decided to be a lawyer. Now, utilizing what the new lesson that I learned, I did something that changed my, my life by my practice was I connected the dots backwards. Later on in my life, I was CEO of Samsung's first phone division, the world's first smartphone, ran into Steve Jobs who told me the exact same thing. You've got to connect the dots backwards. Well, my what was to be rich. My why was to help my mom to buy a house and a car. 
my what, but in order to get my how, what I did is I looked up what legal jobs paid the most money. And it was oil and gas litigators in the early 90s. And so I went to the law school, school that was best known for maritime law or oil and gas law and had the most kids graduate with the highest paying jobs, which was Tulane University in New Orleans. So I reversed engineered where I went to law school, despite other people giving me all what they wanted for me. Uh, those people are called family and friends. Uh, they're always voting for what they want for you. Uh, the problem with when people vote for what they want for you is what they want for you has already been done. We would never expand and grow and accelerate if we were always listening or voting for what other people wanted. We need to vote for what we wanted. And so I did that. And when I graduated law school, I was always a person that kept my options open. I knew that the richest people in the world always had options. And a lot of times they were able to diversify with those options and then they look like geniuses. So if a guy had $20 million and invested in 10 companies at $2 million each and nine of them failed, but one of them made a hundred million, everyone called that guy a genius or Midas. Uh, and so I decided opportunities and options were good. So when I graduated law school, I had two job offers. One, being an oil and gas litigator, making six figures and probably being able to pay off my law lanes eventually and buy my mom a house and a car. The other one was a sales job, which had a comp plan of 250 grand a year, but it was selling legal research in the early 90s, 1992 online. Uh, now the internet was nothing like it is today in 1992, uh, nothing at all. And go Google it, figure out how slow 9,600 bound modems are and what a monochrome XT computer looked like. Um, and so when I went to my mom, I asked her, you know, what should I do? Should I be this oil and gas litigator or should I sell legal research on the internet? Without blinking, my mom said, David, you need to be a real lawyer. This internet thing is a fad. You're gonna lose all your money and waste your time. You need to be a lawyer. You need to finish what you started. And for the first time I realized I was gonna vote for what I wanted. Now my mom, who's a second grade teacher and filled up greeting cards and turnstiles at the 7-Eleven who loved me more than anyone could ever love and had sacrificed for me more than anyone would ever sacrifice for me was wrong. She didn't know what I wanted. She wanted for me what she thought I wanted and that doesn't get me there. That ends up in resentment and offense and separation. And so I went ahead and I took the job in the internet and nine months out of law school, I was a millionaire. Uh, people ask me how I made a million dollars nine out of, uh, months out of law school. It's a practice that you should be using today. I use the power of 64, which I put into my first book, Connected to Goodness. The power of 64 was quite uh, obvious to me is if I was going to hit my number, $250,000 number, then I would have to work because I was so inexperienced. I'd have to work or be productive twice as many hours. So if the average person was productive eight hours, I was gonna focus and make sure I was productive 16 hours a day. I then realized that if I could shift the way my mindset was, something that I had control of, I read a book called Think and Grow Rich, which changed my life. And if I change the way I look at things, the things they look at change. So I immediately said, beyond working, or working 16 hours a day, what if I shifted my paradigm and said, I'm gonna have activity I get paid for 16 hours a day, Therefore, I can do that seven days a week because work is something that's tiresome. It drains our energy. It sucks our, our, our spirit. But activity I get paid for raises my vibration in spirit. It's exciting. And I could do activity I get paid for every day. I don't want to work every day. I can vacation every day. And then I came up and learned that two minutes a day is worth more than two hours on a Saturday. So I figured, okay, I am going to have activity I get paid for 16 hours a day. Now, what about efficiencies? What if I could be twice as efficient with my 16 hours? My 16 hours of productivity now become 32 hours of productivity seven days a week. And how do I do that? Well, time is a variable in which seems to create great efficiencies. So I started looking for four minutes in everything. And I made a joke of it all the time, whether I was eating, sleeping, whatever it was, I was looking for four minutes a day. Why? Because if I could save four minutes in brushing my teeth, eating, packing my lunch, going to the bank machine, making phone calls, getting off the phone early, whatever it was, four minutes a day turned into 24 hours of productivity a year. I was 24 years old. Imagine how many hours 
of productivity, especially if I was twice as efficient with it and twice as productive. Like, imagine how many hours in my lifetime, by the time I was 40, I'd beat people with math because I'd have 32 hours of productivity, seven days a week until I was 40 years old. Oh my goodness. Then I thought about practicing. And this is a key thing for today. If you're not developing skills, acquiring more knowledge, and practicing ending fear, being inspired, continuing to be what you must be, you know, you must be what you can be. And that attitude is the common denominator of all successful people. If you're not working all three of those things right now, you are making a huge mistakes. Most of the people don't and haven't been in an employment economy that's going to shift as quickly and as negatively as possible. Meaning most of the people that work for me had never ever worried about having a job. Meaning if I fired them or they left, they would instantly find a job because they had a pulse. <coughs> this is the type of employment atmosphere we were in. No more. So you better be developing your skills, acquiring knowledge, and learning to practice ending fear. Increase that inspiration. Be what you must be. You must be what you can be. And so I said to myself, I'm going to practice. I'm going to practice what I do so that I'm twice as statistically successful. So if most people get two sales out of 10 calls, I'm getting four sales out of 10 calls by practicing in the mirror on my eight millimeter little camera to my family and friends, all in, in my meetings. Because if I can be twice as statistically successful in what I do, I can have 64 hours of activity I get paid for a day, 64 hours of productivity a day times seven days a week. So when I made my first million dollars, nine months out of law school, and the West publishing people from Minnesota were giving me awards and accolades and everyone's like, oh my gosh, how did he blow out the comp plan? He's 24 years old. He doesn't have any connections, any relationships, hardly knows how to sell. How did he do it? I was giggling inside because I beat you in math. I worked what they considered 10 years of productivity. It would take most of those salespeople, if they had equal skills, 10 years, seven days a week, 64 hours a day of activity I got paid for. So I was laughing inside because I was well below the comp plan because I only made about 100,000 a year. I just did it within nine months. And I use that math, that incremental segmentation to develop my skills, knowledge, and desire my entire career is three years into my career, we sold the company for $3.4 billion to Thompson Reuters. Then in 19, that was in 1995. Then I went to the, to the internet, keeping my options open. I went into middleware, transcoding the internet onto WAP phones, old push button phones. And then once again, keeping my option opens, I moved into hardware, being the CEO of the first smartphone. People used to laugh at me in 1999 when I told them, you see this Windows CE device, this Windows operating system? Someday you'll be able to talk to for free, full duplex to China in color for free. For free. You could do this for free. And they'd laugh at me as if I was talking about there's aliens. It, I swear, people did not believe me. But I believed. And I became a multimillionaire. I married my dream girl. Now, one of the lessons that I learned took a little while to learn. When I was five years old, uh, my dad was my hero. He left. And my dad left my mom and, and six kids. And back then in the 70s, there wasn't any deadbeat dad. So my dad was wealthy, married a girl closer to my age than his, drove around in convertible Cadillacs, but he didn't pay child support. So here's my mom struggling, packing our dinners, working two jobs, and me telling my mom, how come you can't be more like dad? Uh, so guilt, once again, uh, is overridden in my life. But when I was 10 years old, my dad made a huge mistake. He uh, forgot my birthday. And he broke my heart, not because he forgot my birthday, but because when I asked him, how could you forget my birthday, he lied to me. He said, I didn't forget your birthday. I don't believe in birthdays. At that moment in my life at 10, I became estranged from my father. I had interference between that relationship because I knew my father was a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, overseller, a back-end seller, and I hated him. But when I was 30 years old as a multimillionaire, married to my dream girl, once again, reinforcing money buys love and happiness in my life. I married a girl that I met in the fourth grade. My best friend asked her to go study in sixth grade camp, and she said, no, tell him to ask me himself. Now, somehow that I made money, she was interested in me and married me, and now I receive a birthday present at 30 years old from my father 
beautiful sport coat and I put it on and I start to cry. My wife said, what's the matter? I said, I can't believe my dad finally gets it. I can't believe he's thoughtful enough to give me this gift and to admit that he believes in birthdays. And she said, oh, I said, and it fits me. That means he called somebody and asked and I opened it up and then rage came over me because he had torn out all the lining and pockets. So I immediately picked up my phone and I called my dad. I said, dad, why do you punish me? He said, what are you talking about? I, go, I got your gift. Why would you give me a gift with no pockets, no lining? I can't wear the, the jacket. Why would you do that? He said, because it's not for wearing. I said, what is it for? He said, it's to hang in your closet to remind you that you're just like me. And I said, I'm nothing like you. You're a liar, a cheater, a manipulator, a back end seller, an overseller. I'm nothing like you. I hate you. He said, you can hate me, but you're just like me. He said, that jacket is to hang in your closet to remind you that you can't take anything with you when you're gone. You're going to be buried in that jacket, son. You're going to know that you're not going to be the richest man in the cemetery. Don't make the same mistakes that I made. I don't want you to make the same mistakes. So I gave you that jacket. I said, I hate you, dad, and hung up. At 36 years old, I was now the CEO of the world's most famous sports agency, Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. I sat in my office between Lee Steinberg and the Hall of Fame quarterback Warren Moon looking from the Jerry Maguire offices over Catalina Island. I was a multimillionaire. I had everything I could ever dream of. And I took my best friend golfing, uh, the guy who asked my wife to go steady at sixth grade camp, and she said no. And when I took him golfing, I asked him one quick question. I said, man, how come you don't hang out with me? I could take you to the Super Bowl, the Pro Bowl, the Masters, Kentucky Derby. We could hang out with Hall of Famers and athletes, entertainers, celebrities. Why don't you come with me? It's incredible. He said, well, because I don't like who you hang out with. And I said, well, I'm not doing the same things that those guys are doing. He said, David, you can lie to me, but don't lie to yourself. I left that golf round crying. Even when I got home, my, mom's, my, mom, my wife asked me what's the matter, and I told her I was so insulted and offended that I had offered my best friend all of these great things, and he put me down and told me you know, that he didn't like my friends. She kind of rolled her eyes and said, well, maybe you should think about it. And I knew at that time it was true. Two weeks later, I came home, uh, 5.30 in the morning. I was at the Grammy Awards with a guy named Little John. Uh, later to become a really famous rapper and Pepsi commercial star and other things. But John and I have been partying. I came home, intoxicated, high, 5.30 in the morning, my wife waiting for me. And that's when she changed my life. Uh, my wife told me when I got home that she wasn't happy and that I better take stock in who I was and what I wanted to become. The same way all of you should be taking stock in who you are and what do you wanna become? If you're not taking inventory of your personal values, your experiential values, your receiving values, and your giving values right now every day in these times of uncertainty and accelerated change, you're making a big mistake. Don't be afraid to be a hypocrite. Don't be afraid to say, you know what? I don't think the same as I did yesterday or a year ago or 10 years ago. Don't be afraid to be a hypocrite because you're looking at the biggest hypocrite you'll ever meet. And I stood there in front of my wife as a bigger hypocrite than probably most of you, if not all of you. But when my wife told me she wasn't happy, I got furious. I said, what the F are you talking about? Look at the cars we have, the houses we have. I own a golf course, a ski mountain. We could do whatever we want. You have a live-in nanny, three beautiful daughters. You have never worked a day in your life. What are you talking about? You are so ingrateful. You're amazing. F you, I went to bed. When I woke up in the morning, I was even more upset. I started thinking how I was gonna collect all the things that I had bought. I thought about all those things I was gonna take from her, my kids, the houses, I was gonna leave her with nothing. How dare, how dare she offend me like that? How dare she not understand what I've sacrificed for her? And as I'm thinking about what law school buddy to call to represent me in my divorce, I look over in my closet to a jacket I hadn't seen in over six years, somehow just glaring at me. And that jacket looked at it and it changed my life because I looked at it and I realized, man, I'm just like my dad. 
I'm a liar, I'm a cheater, I'm an overseller, a back end seller, a manipulator. And I better for sure take stock in who I was and what I wanted to become. So I sat down and I thought about my values and I came up with four pillars that everyone should consider today to add to their personal experience of giving and receiving. One, gratitude. I'd lost my gratitude. Gratitude had made my past unbelievable, my present better, my future brighter. No matter what happened, it gives you an unbelievable perspective in life. The second, empathy or forgiveness. I could not forgive myself, so I couldn't forgive others. And forgiveness gives you peace. I had lost my perspective and my peace. And then third, accountability. I was living below the line in blame, shame, and justification. I needed to take accountability for everything in my life, ask myself, what, am, what did I do to attract this to myself? And what am I supposed to learn from it? Life is about lessons. What am I supposed to learn from it? Every mistake, failure becomes a miracle when I find the lesson, the light, and the love in it. I can learn to love everything I do. And then finally, understanding effective communication with the universe which is called inspiration. I am in spirit. I am connected to at all times, the greatest source of light, love, and lessons at all time. Consider the source of light, love, and lessons, the sun, and you are not only a solar panel, but a appreciating battery. What does that mean? Is that the sun gives us its energy. We take it in, we appreciate it, add value to it, and then we give it away. But what I had done through my ego is created all these clouds, all this pain, right? Pain is just a message to you that you haven't learned the lesson. If you have physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, economic pain, it's just a message that you need to learn a lesson. And I was going to now live with gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and effective communication. I was going to live an inspired life. And I started that day to do so. I had bottomed out two years before I lost everything. So when I lost over a hundred million dollars, claimed bankruptcy in 2008, I was well prepared. And now 13 years later, I'm even more prepared. I'm more prepared to smile through the struggles, to know that I control four things, my mindset, my feelings, what I say and what I hear and what I do. I live myself with these five things and then I'm gonna let you ask some questions. Write down these five. Number one, I take inventory every day of my personal values, my experiential values, my giving values, and my receiving values. I take inventory of those every day without being afraid to be a hypocrite. I am not afraid to tell you that I've changed my mind, I've changed my values, and if I have to do it every day, I will, because I'm going to vote for what I want in my life according to what I've learned. If I tell you my values are the exact same since I've been 20, I'm telling you I haven't learned anything. And that's not the life that I lead. I live in enjoyment of the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential. Number two, I've learned not only to be of service and to provide value to others and to shift the paradigm of value to make room for what I want. But more importantly, I've learned radical humility that it takes much more humility to ask for help. I no longer have gate people, gatekeepers in my life. I no longer have resistance or objections or voids or shortages. I only have sponsors and power sponsors. When I met Zach, he immediately realized my philosophy and my true beliefs in life. I was not only a sponsor of him, someone who could ask for help for him, but I was a power sponsor. I was someone that could help and find other people to help. Thank but it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be unless you asked. So I teach everyone, number two, to ask a series of questions of how you can be of service of value of others, and two, how a series of questions others can help you or find somebody to help you. Third, most importantly, student of your calendar. When I say study your calendar, I have a mathematical formula that makes things happen in my life. It's studying means this, pay attention to and give intention to the coincidences that you want. Attention plus intention equals coincidences in your life. Some people call it luck. I call it math. Some people call it luck. I call it math. 
So what I do every day is I pay attention to, give intention to the coincidences of what I have planned during the day, what I don't have planned in the day. I study the white space, the blank space, the empty space in my calendar, and I also study sleep. Sleep is the number one habit we all share. We spend about eight hours a day on that habit. And most of us, if not all of us, forget to pay attention and give intention to create the coincidences we want for sleep. Most of us live lives of myth of Sisyphus where you're carrying a boulder to the top of the mountain and you're allowing it to roll downhill. When you wake up, you're at the bottom of the hill again. Plateau and grow, study sleep. I have a sleep mentor at all times. I have a sleep coach, more important than any other coach that I have. If I'm gonna give you some simple advice today and you can't remember any of the lessons that I have and the reason it is because lessons are gonna keep on coming until you learn them and result in pain if you haven't learned them. Here's the key to lessons though. You're gonna forget every goddamn lesson you ever learned. But you have the power to access those lessons even one that you haven't learned before. So these lessons, they keep on coming. And we're here to, to learn those lessons, expand and grow in whatever capacity it is. And so living your life with these lenses of productivity, accessibility, and gratitude, why you're giving attention and intention, write these three things down. You're gonna have a takeaway from here. It's not gonna be what you think. Number one, say thank you every day. Number two, drink a gallon of water every day. And number three, sleep eight hours a day. You do those three things, you'll be amazed what your life is like. I know there's a whole bunch of complex, billions of dollars of money. Plan for this, you should there you go. <laughs> Billions of dollars spent, uh, but life's pretty simple. Drink a gallon of water, say thank you, and sleep eight hours. You'll be so far ahead of everyone else. The fourth thing, by the way, so you got take inventory of your values, ask and attract, series of questions of how you can be of service and how someone else can be of service. Be a student in your calendar. Attention plus intention equals coincidence. Four, do it now, right? People used to say, oh, you got to be present. No, just do shit now. 100% of all things that you do now get done. People who get shit done are far ahead of those who don't. So ask yourself, can I do it now? And if you can do it now, do it. You'll save a minimum twice as much time and be exponentially more successful. Do things now. If you can't do it now, create some sort of system, a repository, a list, a folder to put the stuff that you can't get done now and then prioritize it by what's most important. Put it into your calendar, pay attention, give it intention and create the coincidences in a prioritized manner from your calendar. And then finally, most importantly, most applicable to today, practice ending fear. Practice ending fear. Identify what puts you into fear, the need to be right, offended, separate, inferior, superior, anxious, angry, guilty, whatever it may be, identify it. Know that when you're in a fear mindset, when you're in an ego-based mindset, it edges the goodness out of your life. It edges the gold out of your life. It puts your mind, body, and soul on fire. And if you're on fire, stop, drop by breathing, breathe through your nose, out through your mouth. I call it the six breaths of the ferocious Buddha. In through the nose, out through the mouth. Stop, drop, and then roll in the trajectory that you want to be in towards the objectives that you've studied in your calendar, the coincidences that you want. And if you do this, you will help me reach my mission in life to empower a thousand people like you, to teach another thousand people like you, to teach another thousand people like you to be happy. Happiness is the best virus. It's a virus that can be shared by witnessing. It's so powerful. Not only can it spread just by looking at it, but it also will strengthen your immune system and kill all other viruses. And so I'm living my life in a mission. You know, Zach was joking around. I could just have recorded 30 minutes ago what I just did and given it to this group, but I am on a mission to create a collective consciousness of abundance so that nobody has to live in a world of not enough. Nobody has to live in a world filled of just enough, but you can live with me in the world of more than enough more than enough of everything for everyone filled with happiness. I appreciate everyone's time. I'm happy to take a few questions if you'd like. Beautiful. Thank you, David. Um, we have a couple of comments here. Please, everybody in the chat or the Q&A box, please submit any questions you have. A comment here first from Evan Gutierrez says, this is great stuff. I'm going to have to rewatch while drinking a gallon of water. Okay, Evan. Well, cool. uh, Jason Weber asks, do you believe that everyone should have a five-year plan? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I believe in segmentation. Uh, so I believe in connecting the dots backwards. Time is an illusion, it's, it's uh, relative. So what does that mean? If you're in the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential, 
Uh, and let's say you have a big, outrageous goal, like empowering a billion people. Well, getting to a billion people to me is math. So for me to get to a billion people, I could say, well, if I could empower two people a year, how many segments would it take me to get to a billion? So two people a year that'll empower two people to empower two people. Well, all I would have to get to under that formula is a thousand people that can empower a thousand people to empower a thousand people. A thousand times a thousand is a million, a million times a thousand is a billion. Now, time doesn't mean anything. Is that a five-year plan? I don't know. It depends how quickly I can accelerate empowering people. But if I am consistent and persistent in the pursuit of that and enjoy the pursuit of that, it may come faster than five years. Why would I limit myself? So for me, my goals, and I'm very mission-oriented, I'm the ferocious Buddha, right? So I am fired up every single day, inspired to reach these goals, and my goals don't have a time limit on it. Now, I will spend a minimum amount of time trying to achieve it because I believe consistent behavior, two minutes a day is worth more than two hours on a, on a Saturday. So I'm very routine oriented with priorities in mind. So I spend a minimum of an hour a day on my health. I spend a minimum of 30 minutes with my wife, a minimum of 30 minutes with my 10 year old son, a minimum of two minutes with my teenage daughters, a minimum of one minute a day with my mom to tell her that I'm happy, I'm healthy, I love her and appreciate her. But those are worth so much more time and I get to where I want much faster. I have achieved, for example, most of you probably know one of my mentors, Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, Gary asked me to be an advisor, consultant for him when they launched their sports agency three Super Bowls ago. Well, I asked him and was smart enough to ask him, hey, can you help build my brand? I'm a middle-aged mutant turtle. I've been in the traditional branding world forever. I don't know what Instagram really means. Uh, or any of these other ones, can you help me? And he said, well, what's your objective? I said, well, I want to empower a billion people to be happy. And I think I'm going to have to use social media because it has 4 billion people on it. And it's a lot easier that way to reach a billion people. And uh, he said, oh, how are you going to do that? I said, well, I'm going to do it two people at a time, like Noah. He's on Noah. I go, yeah, you know, like Noah's Ark. I'm going to get two people to empower two people to empower two people. <laughs> and he said, oh, really? How are you going to do that? I said, well, all I would have to do is do, you know, two people a year to power two people a year. And eventually the segmentation, I'm going to live another 60 years. I got plenty of time. It'll just happen as fast as I can. And he said, oh, then I'll help you. He said, if you had told me you wanted a million followers, I told you to F off. He said, that's something I can work with. And I have segmented that out. It's not going to take me a lifetime, right? I'm already gaining momentum because I've detached my emotions from the outcome. And I'm specifically working in the context of what do I do every day without quit to pursue my potential. Very important is incremental growth and acceleration. Why? Because our, our senses can't understand it. Take a smallest measurement you want for what you want to do and keep on doubling it until it gets to where you want to be. And then now it's just a matter of time how quickly you can get it to double. And we do that not by putting a limit on it, by simply by executing on the efficiencies, effectiveness, and statistical success of what you're doing. Detaching our emotions from the happiness of the outcome and putting it into the pursuit, learning to find the love, light, and lessons in what we do. Great. I personally have one more question here as well. Um, you constantly teach people not to do what you love, but to love what you do. Do you have any tips or advice for people on, you know, how somebody who maybe is in a position that they don't love, to love what they do? Well, first of all, it's a matter of learning to love what you do. So you've been a step farther than what you're talking about, Zach, because it takes a lot of intention to learn to love what you do. And what I do is the first step is to find the light or love or lessons in what I don't like. I use the trash example. I hated taking out the trash. It's like bad trash karma, six kids. I was always the one. It spilled on me. It cut me if it could. It took my time. It wasted. This was a nightmare. Then my fraternity, I end up being the smallest guy in my fraternity, so they make me take the trash out. Then I have three daughters. Krypton, it might as well be kryptonite trash. None of them would touch this stuff. <laughs> so I started studying trash. What does that mean? I started paying attention to and giving intention to taking out the trash and getting the coincidences I want. So I looked at trash a different way. I listened to Max Planck and, and Wayne Dyer. I said, change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. So I looked at trash not as something that I had to do. 
I started looking at it as what if I get to do this? What would I get to do? Oh, I get to spend time away from everyone else in meditative state of thinking about, it's time to think about what do I wanna think about? Oh, being happy. I don't really spend any time during the day thinking about what makes me happy. What if I, every time I saw trash, used it as an opportunity, not a punishment, an opportunity to give intention to what I want to be happy. So all of a sudden I started taking out the trash at home at my friend's house, my friend's wife's all of a sudden thought he started to see me in a different light. My employees see me in a different light. I shifted my energy so much into trash that my teenage daughter, who literally trash was kryptonite to, offered to take the trash out because of the way I felt about it and she felt about it now. So you can learn to love anything that you do. And if there's people that bug you and you can't get away from them because they're family, friends, or associates in the next desk over, then understand them. That's the way we find light and love and lessons in people is to try to understand them, not to resist them, and then pray for their happiness. Those two things will absolutely shift your energy and the paradigm of any resistance, voids, or shortages that you have in relationships that may seem to you to be, in your perspective, negative. Beautiful. Guys, I want to thank everybody for coming here. Kayla has posted in the chat how you can get in touch with Dave, how you can join his free training this Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And, you know, we're going to obviously post the recording on social media and send it out to everybody here. But Dave... You're all about gratitude and giving first and being of service. And on a personal level, I want to thank you very, very much for making time today and sharing life lessons with everybody here. Thank you for making me so proud by empowering others, Zach. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Talk soon.